Mint work, which we'll talk about today, focuses on um, creating new forms of physical and virtual collaboration that empower all members of the design process. His research focuses on using technology to create new relationships between users, architecture, and its context through interaction, sensing, and feedback, and mixed reality. His new book, The Ecologies of the Building Envelope, A Material History and Theory of Architectural Surfaces, published by ACTAR in 2021, written with Alejandro Zaira Polo, analyzes how social, political, technological, and economic forces have become embedded within architecture over the last century. Unrelated to XR. Work. Unrelated completely to XR. It's a pleasure to have him. He's also here helping us um, with our burgeoning um, lab building the plane um, in the air. So super excited to have him. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Anderson. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invite um, to the first lecture in the TV lab. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a number of projects uh, that I've worked on over the last couple of years in the AR and VR space, but I'm going to try to frame them through kind of provocations. So rather than just, this is my project, blah, 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 I'm going to kind of lead you through what is an interface, what can an interface do, how do we interact with the digital landscape? Um, how can we communicate between physical and digital systems? These sorts of things. Um, Jacob gave a great introduction to me. I have a number of associations uh, teaching um, at UPenn and Pratt, working at Mancini Duffy and the Tool Belt Company, and then also with the kind of private practice where I do um, freelance AR and VR development. Um, I'm gonna talk through projects that I've done with these various associations. And at the end, if there's time, talk through some student work and some workshop work um, that kind of raises some of these uh, questions of what does it all mean? Um, so what is an interface? So getting started with um, all of this work in VR and AR, um, I started around 2015 when the first um, VR development kits became available. So Oculus and HTC released a, a dev kit to be able to begin making content for VR at a time when it wasn't quite ready for consumer use. And this is the time when I was in school and I was thinking a lot about the design process and breakdowns in communication that occur in um, relating between what our mind wants and who is doing it and how the hand makes that work. And I found that there is an opportunity for, um, given these new technologies and spatial computing, that rather than interfacing between people and creating these kind of symbolic um, relationships between a mouse click and something else, that those could be directly related. So rather than this kind of cycle of communication that using something like a VR headset and a, a hand tracking system, you could bring all those um, communication uh, breakdowns closer together so that my intention goes directly into um, some kind of uh, uh, interaction with geometry and space uh, right away. So my thesis uh, project was a kind of simultaneous design and experience uh, in 2015 where you could use your hands to create geometry gesturally, move it, manipulate it, using some of the tools that we're kind of used to grouping things, locking different geometry as you're working on, a, on an idea, um, and then flying through the space in VR. So what this required me to do, because I was using my hands as a communication, as an input device, instead of a mouse and keyboard, was that I had to program meaning into a series of gestures. So how do you tell if this is a command or this is a command or this is a command? There's uh, lots of ambiguity in these. So developing kind of layers of meaning where you would enact some kind of uh, command over, a, over time uh, was really important to developing this interface. And this type of work where how do you get someone to do something and know what they're supposed to do and make it intuitive um, influences my design now, even though 
once we have like better track controllers, as like I'm not ever using my hands again because it's difficult. Um, so in the end, you know, this was a kind of um, sketching tool that let you quickly, you know, it's more gestural than it is precise. Um, but it was a kind of idea generator. So rather than uh, the kind of napkin sketch, you could do a kind of spatial experience quickly and develop uh, some geometry at different scales. Um, so this is kind of exploring a smaller scale, more of a, like a tower scale, interacting with gravity and other systems. And then a kind of imagining a kind of programming exercise where you might have different meaning associated to different uh, things. So these three tests were done, you know, one hour in VR each to, you know, try to sketch out an idea really quickly. Since then, um, I have been working at an architecture firm called Mancini Duffy, who hired me to begin rethinking what the design process and interactions with clients could be in the future. Um, and in this lab, I developed a software called Toolbelt, which is a kind of one-click Revit or Rhino to VR, interactive VR experience um, that we first rolled out inside the office. And then when COVID hit and we made it like multiplayer and remote interaction, we packaged it into a software that we're releasing outside of the office. So this was our original design lab which you, you know, we experimented with a bunch of technologies to change how we interact with clients and produce different types of um, work for projects. And we recently moved to a new design lab, a new office with a new design lab, which is why Jacob reached out to me. So we're creating a TV lab here. What kinds of technology do you use and how do you interact in a professional setting uh, with clients? So this is something we've been discussing over the last couple of days here. Um, and it's really nice to, to see this work going on um, at your university. Um, for the software, we kind of position it as a way to transform any 3D model into an interactive multiplayer experience. And that's something that we want to differentiate ourselves from other technologies like Twinmotion or Enscape or Lumion, where the file is really designed around a kind of um, animated quality, like a pre-made, pre-canned. And for us, it's really important to have clients able to move objects around, change colors live in VR or on desktop and keyboard while they're kind of moving around. So that's our kind of difference for the software. And what it looks like is we'll bring a client into a space, orient them around a plan or whatever fly through of what we're working on. And then they're able to jump into the VR experience where they can get a feel for the space. This is kind of coming out of my thinking from thesis and the kind of video of the toilet moving back and forth that I showed a moment ago, that we design in certain softwares and then we take those designs and convert them into something else using another software. For example, we create a 2D rendering and then we cut sections and plans of our models, package them into a PDF, and give that presentation in 2D to a client who is a non-expert. Um, that gets digested by them. There may be some ambiguities in understanding and, um, uh, and communication between us and them. We write down our feedback in some other format, and then we go back and sit down at our desks and do the design work again. So what we kind of imagine for this software is that visualization, presentation, and feedback all happen within the software, where instead of you should move this table over or this color is not right, um, they just reach out and change it. Or someone takes a note and anchors it to a 3D space. So that all happens uh, more fluidly and lets us go back without any communication breakdowns between what we're talking about. Um, I really like using this software in like schematic design and design development. And we rarely do a kind of finished marketing VR experience, but it is something we do occasionally. So here in the top left, you see like white box SD, 
in the top right, you see like some materials, texture and color, and DD, and then in the bottom, a kind of final uh, rendered out version of the, of the experience. We originally designed this for clients coming to our design lab to experience a kind of specialized interaction with us in, uh, in our space. But when COVID hit and everyone went remote, we quickly switched it to a kind of multiplayer desktop and keyboard or VR interface. So you could be um, at home moving around a model and see avatars of everyone else that was also moving either in VR or also on desktop and keyboard. So this is a really important uh, a moment for us where we realized like, oh, this is a software that we can, we can bring outside of the office. Um, something that I've really enjoyed being in the office and working in the design lab is that a lot of these tools were developed with clients over time. Like, oh, I can move around and move objects, but I need to measure things, or I want to change the material of that. So that was all kind of developed as I was working on projects with, uh, with other designers in the firm and engaging with clients in this. So all of the kind of semantics around like, look down, select the red button on the right, that kind of language and simplicity of the user interface was developed through fumbling around with clients in person. We eventually patented this process. It's patent pending, um, maybe it'll really complex for a fan, I have no idea, uh, but an interesting exercise to go through. And then we've used it on a number of clients and this has actually expanded our offices client types. So this is very like experience based, very engaging um, in a kind of unique way. So we're starting to get like startups who don't know what they're doing and they need a bunch of trucks to move in through the space and another area where people come in and engage with them. So this is really nice for them to program and change what's going on in real time with us and figure out the design without the kind of like top down, here's how it's gonna be or like them pretending like they understand what a plan is when we're having a presentation. Or even the like, we made three options, pick one you like and then we'll make three more. This is like, it makes the decision-making process for clients much, much faster, which has been really rewarding for me in a variety of scenarios. Um, this was our like marketing video, but the nice thing about it is we have a Revit plugin, which lets you kind of click on one button and take any 3D view from Revit, any geometry in a 3D view. So you can quickly like section box off something and like just see what this room looks like. We also have um, a web version of it, which um, is nice for people that don't want to download the desktop app. Um, and it's been nice even internally in the office, like a project manager is on vacation, but they want to check in on what their team is doing while they're sitting on a beach. That has like actually happened with the, the web version, which is really cool. Um, but these fights back and forth and multiplayer of uh, like design elements are really, um, really pretty interesting interactions. Uh, and we prepared a, a demo of this to kind of see what, what the Revit sample project like looks like. Uh, and does that go, that won't go here. No, I think are you gonna join? Um, no. Yeah. So you can see on this little window, you know, first of all, the ability to move beyond your local area, right? So we're in architectural spaces and you can teleport. Um, Jacob likes coming out in this courtyard and remaking. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a typical client will come in and move furniture around and try to get a sense of the space. And then for us, you know, 10 years ago, you might have shown a client a rendering. And if they were like, I want the wall to be brick, you'd say, oh, great, we can do that. Come back in two weeks and we'll show you the new rendering of the brick. And now they can just reach out and touch it and, and manipulate its um, materials and geometry. Another important thing about the interface here is that um, 
we have this kind of third person over the shoulder camera, which is really, we just developed it because it's kind of nauseating to um, see the first person view. This is what you would normally see, flip around a little bit. Uh, this view can be kind of like nauseating. That's what he's seeing, and it's very comfortable for him. But it can get um, overwhelming on like a big projector in the space for clients to see. So this interface was designed with, uh, with kind of clients in mind uh, and a kind of collaborative experience in mind. Um, Sorry, but I thought you were going to show it on your connect. The Wi-Fi was a problem? Uh, uh, no, it was just complicated. <laughs> yeah. Oh, on my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Great designer here. Cool. We can jump back. Um. Other areas that I've worked on in the past are also mobile AR and headset-based AR. Um, and these projects go back even to like 2017 when uh, Apple first released ARKit. The iPhone 7 had a um, chip in it that allowed you to do simultaneous localization and mapping, moving your camera through space and knowing how the camera is moving. And I use this technology to start speculating on what it would mean for us to be in a kind of spatially synchronized digital landscape. But I think that this has already been the case, right? So anytime you post anything, your IP address and your location are geotagged. And there's this kind of digital overlay of information over the entire world. So we made a speculation on this um, in 2017 called Geobi, where we were imagining um, using ARKit that the kind of um, internet of postings and things like this could be anchored in space and localized to particular areas. So this project is a kind of social media speculation about um, which took your ARKit data and your GPS data and allowed you to anchor objects and uh, drawings and kind of emoji-like stickers in 3D space and keep those persistent. So this is my dog, Lucy. And uh, here you can see me leaving notes and drawings and things like this. Oh no, I've destroyed a toy. No, bad dog. And all of these would sync to a, a database and be kind of anchored in space. This is something where all of you have probably done this now, like the, you have an animated tiger that you put on the ground or something like that. Um, so the technology has become a lot more ubiquitous, but I think there's still not this uh, kind of level of total digital overlay over everything, but it's a, a kind of distinct possibility. So. We have all these posts and things, but they don't interact well with the world. And we were imagining like in Yelp, you pull up an abstraction of where you are, a map, and then you have to find your relative position in the map and view like 2D reviews of things and whatever stars. We were imagining them anchored to physical space such that, you know, someone could come and post something and make it an experience. Someone else could come experience that. Um, um, and then you might, walking down the street later, see a kind of trail of things left by other people. So these are like stickers that we left on the sidewalk. When we localize ourselves with AR, um, you find that, you know, whatever, certain things have gotten reviews in space. This is something where like a head mounted display or imagining as a contact lens or something, this kind of horrifying future of stuff stuck all over the world is, is becoming closer to reality now, I think. Um, as an architect, I like to make AR experiences that are anchored to things or for, for teaching, I have students make models and add digital content to the model accurately. But a lot of technologies are like, I put a tiger in the room 
or I put whatever glowing stickers. Um, so whenever I make an AR app, I like to um, add a kind of calibration routine where you select an area on the ground to create a more accurate experience. Um, for example, an app that you can download on the App Store um, is called Happy Stripe. And this was um, done in collaboration with an architect named Kiki Bhakti, a technologist, um, who was um, commissioned to make a sculpture in Maryland. And she wanted an AR component to it because it was being built during COVID. And she wanted to engage a kind of multiplayer audience. Um, you've all probably used Sketchfab or something like that, where you can add your model to space. But basically, your, your camera is able to tell where it is, how it's moving through space by detecting features in the space um, and understanding how those features change as your camera transforms. So in this case, there was a sticker on the ground at the physical location, or you could do this anywhere at home and you can anchor a uh, AR version of the sculpture to your space. So here you see this kind of structure. Um, and we wanted to, um, you can see it kind of aligned with the ground, but also overlapping here to design for a larger space than we're in right now. Um, but we wanted to engage the kind of local um, uh, people walking around in, in the street. So we made a kind of game where you can, uh, in a multiplayer setting, shoot balls into the sculpture and then gain points. And then the coffee shop next door said, like, if you gain some points, we'll give you a dollar off. So, then, um, so starting to get, engage like physical reality and kind of new form of socialization through uh, this kind of overlay in a, in a particular location. If someone else were to log in, I would see their relative location to wherever they anchor. So if we anchor at the same point, we would be in the same coordinate space. If you were at home, I would see wherever you were relative to the video. Am I still in the right proportion? Yeah. yeah. Um, these types of experiments have led us to expand beyond um, uh, just kind of mobile-based AR. So this is a project done in collaboration with Ryan Johns for the Sol Biennale, which I was just talking about with Wes, um, in which we were, this is 2018, we were trying to imagine a future where humans collaborate with robots more directly and physically in space. And how might we develop a system that makes them feel comfortable to do that? Um, so in this exhibition, um, we designed a system where a robotic arm could um, scan an unknown object. So a guest would give the robot some piece of junk that we found. Uh, the robot would scan it, pick it up, and assemble it onto a wall. And while we did this, um, a projector would project onto the robot's axes how fast each axis was moving. So blue, green, and red, this is dangerous or not. I feel comfortable engaging uh, more closely with this object. And the rest of the room was projection mapped with various information about what you should do in space. So thinking of the robot expanding beyond just the arm actuating one thing, but it's also part of a full experience, which you're kind of standing within uh, at some point. So a guest would pick up literally like a box of junk that we picked up off the ground when they were cleaning up the Biennale before it opened. Uh, the conveyor belt would move forward from the um, giving spot to the picking up spot, scan it, determine its um, uh, center point, and pick it up and assemble it onto this wall. So this is a kind of, you know, partially pre-made tool path for picking up and assembling, but with unknown objects coming in and being input. Here you can see the axes changing colors. 
red moving very fast, green is not moving at all, blue is moving medium or yellow, whatever, um, and how a, a guest might engage with this. There's a kind of sped up version of it. So again, speculating on, you know, beyond just the robot doing something, but me actually collaborating with it to, to achieve some shared goal. Um, and also it communicating other, um, other things to me. It's not in a cage that I can engage with, it's close up and we can touch it and move, move around with it and change its behavior. Um, how are we doing on time? Great. Um, beyond the system, um, um, beyond the kind of spatial AR where we're projecting onto objects in space, um, Ryan Johns and Axel Killian and I um, developed this system a little bit further into a um, multiplayer, multi-device, multi-robot uh, kind of media experience. Um, in which you were able to share a uh, coordinate system with anyone that logged in with either a VR headset, an AR device, or um, what the, the robots were calibrated with the VR device as the kind of master, but you could use iOS or Android to log into this shared um, system. And it allowed us to draw a toolpath for the robot to follow in either AR or VR simultaneously and instruct the robot to physically follow that toolpath or to simulate how it was going to move so that we could check for safety. The robots were calibrated around a Vive tracker, which shared their relative position to everyone involved and streamed their joint angles. So if you were in VR, you could see where the robot was and you weren't in a fully digital landscape. It was a kind of mixed reality. And when you were on a phone, you could see the tool paths that were being drawn. Here on the ground is the kind of shared coordinate system. And you can see the other devices logged in. So these two people have logged in. They're viewing the same thing that is being viewed from this camera. Um, so this kind of media extravaganza, um, I think was really, important for thinking about um, how we might engage with physical systems to actually do something, right? So I can make the robot physically do something through a digital interface, which I think is a really interesting possibility for kind of telepresence and remote collaboration. And here you can see the kind of avatar of the robot streaming its joint angles while it's being physically moved. A relatively good calibration. You can see it's slightly shifted from my point of view on my camera. Um, but the other three robots are also streaming their locations uh, in the background. Here I have a VR person collaborating with me on my phone. I can select this toolpath and preview it, make sure it's safe and it's not going to collide with itself or anything else, and then send it to actually actuate. And while it's doing this, it's streaming those joint angles to the person in VR. Here you can see three people engaging with this system. So two people on the phone, one person in VR. And I think what's important about this is that the coordinate system that's shared with us in the space um, doesn't need to be, you don't need to be in the space with everyone. So I could be at home on my couch and see what everyone else was doing. I would just be in a different kind of coordinate system. Um, this you could speculate on like, oh, we could digitize your whole robotic line and you could move through it digitally and change some of the kinematic behavior of the robots remotely. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how I engage students with this type of um, uh, these type of technological possibilities um, and what we kind of think about when we uh, start working on a project. So when you think about collaborating with robots, this is like universal robots uh, advertising photo. 
And the question is like, what is the role of the human in this? So our robots are getting better. We're able to collaborate with them, but do I just change the oil of the robot? Or do I just move the robot to some new workstation? And I'm not able to engage. It doesn't help me as a human do uh, creative things or fulfilling things. I think that all of this AI and robotics, and AR and VR, we have to keep in mind that the goal is not to have humans do rote tasks. Like I give the robot a two by four and it does the very precise thing. I think that finding a way to have us, um, instead of just uh, fulfilling technological limitations, that we really focus on human creativity as an agent uh, within any type of system. So one way that we collaborate with robots is stopgap collaboration. We fulfill technical shortcomings that would otherwise eliminate the human from the system. Manual assist collaboration, where a robot helps us do something. So an AR system, which tells me where to draw or where to place a brick or um, how to cut a piece of wood. Creative collaboration, which allows me to use the advantages of a computational system to help me be more creative in some task. So humans are really good at gesture and improvisation. Uh, robots are really good at uh, being precise and strong and repeating tasks over and over and things like this. So how can we work together towards those ends? And then environmental collaboration where you might augment someone's sense of space or sensibilities or extend what they can see and feel. So with those types of collaboration in mind, um, I wanted to show a couple of student projects where we use this kind of shared coordinate system idea or um, other systems of engagement with robots to, uh, to speculate on what it means to be in VR, where you could confuse someone's senses, change like these are Cheerios, but instead they're sparkly explosions, or to tactilely engage with something like a robot, which can move around and provide you with some deceptive experience. At the University of Pennsylvania, we've been doing this for like helpful technical tasks, like being able to preview a robot's complex toolpath and make minor adjustments to it before it's sent to the robot. Um, to communicate gesturally, where you might have a general path that you want to follow or have some inspiration while something is moving and have the robot do lots of tiny details while that's happening. Or in kind of like intentionally deceptive uh, scenarios where uh, we might have a tool, we might think we're in some environment. Does the environment we're in change the form of creativity um, that we engage with? If I'm in some crazy rock and roll hellscape, do I do a different type of drawing than if I'm in a beautiful, uh, whatever, serene setting? So these were, this was for the uh, IAC in um, Barcelona where we were dealing with real-time engagement with uh, virtual reality technologies and uh, robotics enacting some of those uh, scenarios with us. So here's a kind of three-dimensional drawing scenario, which is remapped onto a 2D canvas. You can see me, this is only a four-day workshop. You can see me doing the stopgap collaboration giving it a dunk of paint, holding the canvas, maybe moving the canvas a little bit. But I think, you know, this type of interaction is really interesting where I do something, I'm in one world, and then I double check, like, how is that being translated? And I might adjust my behavior on the next, uh, the next um, whatever interaction. A game which, uh, in which you're in a kind of scaled up robotic landscape, um, so in this case, a robot was creating a board game while you were living inside of the board game. Um, so you can see as you move from tile to tile to try to solve some puzzle, the robot is creating your path as a kind of record of what you're doing. Um, but within that system, the engagement uh, 
with the kind of gigantic robot, you know, you're changing your scale. Um, at the human scale, we can only gesture at a, at a particular scale, right? But if we change what that scale means, a robot can engage with it at, at whatever millimeter precision instead of our large gesture. Uh, so this is kind of speculating on this. As I move my tile location, the robot creates that tile in real life and I can see it, pick it up and slam it down next to me. Ah, students making videos. The best part. Okay, look up, see the robot. Okay, there it goes. That's the mini one. And then above you is the giant robot moving the tile in the space. So this is a kind of interesting kind of change of scale experience of me being on a board within a board game kind of landscape. Or a kind of different type of manual assist. Um, you know, which may bring up uh, a, a number of problematic uh, thoughts about the future. Um, this is a, a group which was creating a kind of uh, sand-based uh, concrete mold, um, which looks like this. And they wanted to speculate on the robot spends a lot of time doing the roughing pass for this. But what's really important is when it does the finishing pass. So could we trick a human into quickly following, because a human is very dexterous and can improvise, can we trick a human into performing that roughing pass and then have the robot do the real precise um, work? So they invented a scenario called happy wildlife in which they their job as a person was to feed a baby elephant peanuts and the peanuts were on the kind of roughing pass surface. So they would take a tool, which was tracked in space. The tool transformed into the robot from the VR point of view. And you would follow along picking up peanuts until you're done. And then when you take off the headset, voila, you have your roughing the past time. So here we, can, we see a kind of inverse relationship where the computational system is helping a human do something, but in a like, uh, different environment, a more uh, free and whatever fun environment, I guess. Um, so is this type of interaction the, the future of how we engage with things, tricking people into doing useful labor by making them comfortable? And is that something that's good or a horrifying future dystopia? Um, I think you could speculate on well, if you're going to have to do stuff like this anyway, then uh, it might as well be nice and comfortable for you in some way. But also, should a human be doing this if we have systems to change our relationship to labor? Okay, and perfect timing. Wow, we have 10 minutes for questions and... Uh, uh, thoughts and uh, any engagement with you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Do you need me to change anything? Cool. Anyone have any questions or want to look at anything else? All right, so you on Twitch, it sees that. Okay, cool. Yes, I'll do this. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about um, the Happy Start app. Yeah. Like other kind of digital interfaces with AR that you've seen that are useful for developing one's own practice in that space. Yeah. Um, or even tools to kind of, uh, for people that are looking to get into that, learning about how the interaction takes place also needs to be good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I use Unity to develop uh, uh, probably almost all of these um, experiences that I showed you, um, in which you can you can download a development kit for AR Kit or AR Core for iOS or Android. But there's also like more simple tools to start getting into this that have come out more recently. So Unity has like an easier workflow called Unity Mars. 
uh, that lets you like model and anchor things um, in AR easily. Um, what's the one that you were just looking at? Niantic Lightship. So Pokemon Go, they have a developer kit where um, you can create a multiplayer experience and share your location with other people and create like persistent geometry in space. Um, Sketchfab has like built-in AR. If you get the Sketchfab app, you can upload a model to the library and then see it in AR. That's like a really quick way to like, you know, scale and move around and share uh, a 2D geometry. Um, but I also think, you know, there's other uh, more complex interactions as well. Another app I've made called, is called Virtual Fresco where it's meant to align with uh, a ceiling fresco in Carnegie Mellon, where you can click on the tiles in the fresco and get information about the, the painting in it, which I think is really nice. So that's something you won't get from like a pre-canned model to AR thing, like embedding more information in a custom experience. But Unity has amazing tutorials like learn.unity.com as a, is a great, I am self-taught in Unity. So it's something if you're interested in pursuing, I, I would probably start there. Anyone have any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Thanks so much for, it's great to see everything in Silicon Valley. I think it's really impressive. I think the image to me that stands out, I'm trying to like, piece together what it all means. Yeah. In one sense. Well, first of all, I'm not an expert in the topic, but second, it seems kind of it's pretty diverse in, mm -hmm. in the different applications. Some things have to do with like material assemblies and but it all but the image that stands out to me is always like when somebody does a VR headset but then it's like peaking yeah, into yeah. reality and then back in the headset and then back it comes to reality. And that kind of engagement to me is what is like super exciting and compelling. Yeah. Like the double, the double check. Like yeah. Is it, so like the AR app, the, the ball, shooting the ball, and uh -huh. like the, you get a copy, um, yeah. and you get a certain number of points or something. That's a version of like that would come out. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wonder like, uh, I guess generic, but um, yeah, and then tool belt is sort of its own thing also. Um, like, where is it? I guess um, I don't even know. Like, what? Is, what is the? I guess that doesn't need to be a focus. You just sort of uh -huh. like, when an opportunity presents itself, you seize upon it. And yeah. You know, using these tools, I wonder, like, because um, there's like the Nazi and Polar, who are like, how do we use robots to, you know, appear uh, and producing? Building assemblies, technology assemblies. That's sort of you're doing that with the walls. But is there like a is is the umbrella the kind of what is the interaction with the person um, and the robot, and then flushing that out in different avenues, or is it is is there kind of a trajectory that you're moving closer toward? Yeah, I think that um, there's kind of two things I've shown. One is like practical and helpful things. And one is kind of like speculations. Um, and I think all of the work that I've shown is basically about human computer interaction and what is a kind of hybridized physical and digital world look like. Um, I think that the, you know, the, the practical things are like thinking a lot about an interface and how someone step-by-step step is introduced to how to do something in a new way. And then the speculative stuff is kind of like, um, how do we avoid a nightmare scenario where every moment of my life is overlaid with digital stuff? And what is that digital stuff going to be? It's going to be advertisements for the shoes that I didn't know that I wanted. But because I searched for feet, uh, now I have the shoe advertisement. And oh, my size is there and I can check out. And oh, I was trying to do something useful, but this giant ad popped up in front of me and now I'm buying stuff again. So yeah, many of the speculations and provocations I think are uh, on the edge of dystopian, but trying to understand what, what it all means right now. 
three questions simultaneously. <laughs> uh, you can go. Yeah. So it didn't physically fabricate anything. So it was kind of like, can we get a multiplayer system to engage with this robot and have it physically actuate? So there was no tool on the robot. Um, the workshop was all about like calibrating these systems together and making a, um, a kind of shared workspace but didn't do anything with it and haven't worked on that in uh, five years. <laughs> uh, and then there was a question behind you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was just kind of curious about like, biofeedback systems. I know you have people who just ask uh -huh. where is there any coming to you like represent like, the system system going to the sand mm -hmm. or kind of effects like that usually or yeah, so in that case, it was all a kind of just visual feedback. But I think like more research coming out into like a true virtual reality where more senses are being engaged with is like an area of research that's happening right now. Um, personally, in VR games, there the moment that you lose uh, kind of connection to reality is when the, the things you're like holding and touching don't feel like they're real. So when I design a controller thing, like there's a sword on my controller, to me, it has to look like a controller, the part that I'm touching, because that anchors me to reality. And that's also why in VR, like bow and arrow games are very satisfying and sword games are not very satisfying because you don't feel the weight of the thing unless you attach a broomstick or something to your controller. Um, but then you'll break your TV or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something I haven't played around with very much, the kind of like tactile feedback to like my hand is touching something. When I started my thesis, the first thing I did was I made a glove with little vibrating motors so you could like touch a cube. And then I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> There is another question over there, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in an expanded context, there's like a lot of these new technologies that help us do things, but we have to be careful about like, what is my role in this? So like something like Mid Journey or Dali or these uh, kind of AI based text to image things, you know, that's what, that's the technology we have right now. I can type in a thing. It gives me a crazy image that looks beautiful. I can select things and enhance that and amplify it. But what if that technology was a hundred times better? Uh, what would we do? We wouldn't even be like the pickers of good stuff. We would just occupy a world created by something else that is already like existing. So, oh, you want an interior? Here's a million. And we already picked the best one because we already know. And it's like the matrix. It's like, that was a negative thing. Like it was made by the robots and we didn't know whatever. So I think, you know, I think there's danger to these things, but also like lots of opportunity for like, okay, if we frame, reframe that, 
instead of like the AI makes the image for me, it's like, I'm a curator now and anyone can be a curator and develop a sensibility about like good or bad, as opposed to like, it's an automatic thing that just does it for me and I take it for granted. What if robots were a hundred times better? You know, would we be in a school that where we're engaging experimentally with robots or is the world created for us and whatever? I have no idea. Huh? Oh, I was gonna go back here and then go up to you. Is it great? Okay. So you mentioned intuition that you gave us something about falling off and falling off. At least when you're selling things, like being intuitive, like, we, we assume that it's intuitive, yeah. but it's not intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you started with the panels, right? Because mm -hmm. it's more intuitive than you can control it, especially when you don't think that's happening with my sisters or someone like that. Yeah. Uh, I haven't gone back into it. Um, and one reason was that I always say like, it's actually like difficult to do. You have to be like good at it to like move through space. That's why like, dancers or choreographers or sculptors are like really good at some of these VR sculpture programs and architects are more like whatever. I don't know. Um, I haven't gone back into it, but some things that I like are like uh, training gestures where I can say like, this is what I want to happen when I do this and I can expand into different scales. Um, right now, uh, yeah, the Quest has the hand tracking, which is pretty good. What I don't like in the Quest is when your controllers transform into hands. And it's like, I'm holding it. I'm like, feel like I'm holding a controller, but it's, I only see my hands doing like three different things. That sort of thing I really don't like. But I think as, as the hand tracking gets better, um, uh, there will be more opportunity for that. But you still see all of these like very simple gestures as things that can be understood. So like, you always see this one, like picture Greg Lynn doing that at the Biennale. It's the future, hollow lens, or you know, thumbs up, that sort of thing. I did recently use the magic leap to do a, a kind of pull up an interface, go away kind of thing, which was nice. But you had a controller in the other hand to like select more accurately what you were doing. Yeah, and it's like oh, the yeah. Xbox controller, I know where the <laughs> yellow button is, or whatever. Um, I think also there's like a scale of gestures too. So when I was developing mine, there, I was like reading these papers about intuitiveness in gesture, where it's more intuitive to uh, think of um, like mimicking a tool, like hand as knife, as opposed to hand holding knife. That's like easier to learn, like cut, as opposed to like you do this. So some of the gestures like this, was like flying through space. It's like a car. Like I know how to drive through a car. Also in 2015, these headsets would like make you throw up if you were like flying around, but your brain is used to moving while your hands are like this. So that was kind of like where I was thinking about that type of gesture. Um, any other questions? We're starting to encroach on your class time here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Everyone, please enjoy the TV lab as it continues to grow. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, man. That was awesome. Yeah.